My name is David Yun, and welcome to my viewfinder. This is a podcast where I speak to photographers about why they shoot as opposed to what they shoot with. My hope is to produce inspiring content to get you out there looking at the world creatively. Each episode will end in a thought or project to help bring this to the fore, so make sure you get to the end and uh, interact with me. If you're interested in continuing this project with me, you can help me out by clicking subscribe uh, and leaving me a review on your podcast platform of choice. You can also find me on Instagram at my viewfinder podcast. Uh, I'm on Twitter at MVF podcast, or you can email me directly at MVF at gmail.com. In today's episode, I continue my chat with Eric Donovan. As a scientist, Eric's had a variety of life experiences that have framed a pretty interesting relationship with the world. We'll discuss how humans interact with each other through social fictions. We'll get his thoughts on the aurora. Eric says that the aurora itself is just a scientific tool that reflects the magnetosphere, which in turn reflects the health of the Earth itself. And we'll get a glimpse of how valuing happiness gave his Denai guide a purpose in life. But let's start off though asking about food, and then we'll journey with him to the north of Canada and then back to Vancouver Island. Well, how about uh, what's the best meal you've ever had? Can I give two answers? Yeah, of course. Okay, so I I like I do a lot of traveling for work. I did a lot of traveling for work before the pandemic, and one time, you know, there, there's there's different funding agencies and different governments have different attitudes on spending, right? And so if 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 I take somebody out for dinner, if somebody comes from the European Space Agency and visits uh, our group in Calgary, and I take them out for dinner, but I'm supposed to keep the dinner cost to forty five dollars or less for that person uh, in order to bill it to say my my federal government insert grant account, and I can buy the person a glass of wine. But that amount of wine and the amount of alcohol in the meal has to be less than I think it's ten dollars per person, and so, and so that's 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 fine. I mean that that's you know I mean I mean that means I can go out for dinner. I can take somebody for dinner at a, at a relatively nice restaurant in Calgary, and and we can have a decent meal, and it, and it might cost me some more than than the forty five dollars, right? But it's it's still a fun evening, and and it, it's it's nice. But if I go to visit people who are being funded by the European Space Agency. Um, they have a, a very different attitude towards towards this, and and there are times when it appears to me that they have unlimited um, resources for this. And one time, I was with a group of people in a place called Frascati in Italy, outside of Rome, and we went for the meeting dinner, the banquet, not not banquet, but the dinner for the meeting, and it was hosted by our European Space Agency colleagues, and they hosted it, which means they paid. And it was at this beautiful Italian restaurant in, I don't know, maybe a thousand year old building and overlooking on this hill, overlooking Rome. And we were sitting outside and, and it was, I don't even know how many courses the meal was. I have no idea how much wine we drank. It was all fabulous. And there was this kind of, there were olive trees and, you know, and there was this wind and we were look, out, looking out over Rome and, and the food was fabulous. And we, we sat there from probably seven at night until one or two in the morning and just talked and and that that was probably materially the best meal I've ever had in my life. Like really, it was really, it was really, um, and I, I I can't tell you what it was because I didn't really know any of it because it was real Italian food and there was just so many little courses, right? But then when I was, I, I, I think back to when I was 12 years old, my family was visiting uh, Qualicum Beach on Vancouver Island and I'd been out all morning in the sun and the wind and on the beach and I came back and I was really hungry. Like I was really hungry. And you know, you know, and I, I don't know if you've been to Qualicum Beach, but it's on the east coast of Vancouver Island facing the coast mountains and it's really beautiful. And I came back and my grandmother, I was really hungry. I said, Grandma, can I have something? I need something to eat. And so she she made me something that I would never have for lunch, which was scrambled eggs. Just plain scrambled eggs. And put them on a plate and I went outside and I sat there with the plate. And just with the air and the ocean and the smells and all of that, that was possibly the meal I enjoyed the most of any meal I've ever had in my life. I like that there's a interesting dichotomy there, like yeah, absolute opulence and then uh, home home cooking, simplicity with the environmental experience. Yeah. 
I like scrambled eggs. I also like, uh, you know, when you when you invert it and you have like a breakfast for dinner. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> you know, shake things up from time to time. My son and I drove by A and W last night up by Northland Mall, and and they have this big sign up saying breakfast all day. <laughs> and I, I actually have to I have to admit I was I was I was craving like like one of those egg sandwiches. Not the McMuffin, obviously, but but the A and W equivalent, and I I forego to that. <laughs> it's the discipline, yeah. That's the discipline that helps you be successful as a scientist. Maybe I uh, I'm not sure if I'd I'd be able to uh, hold back. My viewfinder is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. If you're looking for more Albertan podcast content, check out their website, Alberta Podcast Network. Here's a brief message from one of our two sponsors today. This episode of My Viewfinder is brought to you by the Calgary Foundation, proudly supporting community needs for 65 years. Empathy, kindness, generosity. We are united in our desire to give, to inspire hope, and transform the lives of people who are struggling in turbulent times. And the Calgary Foundation is here to help. From mental health programs to environmental causes, the Community Knowledge Center website features profiles of charitable organizations, all searchable by area of interest. Be inspired by compelling stories. Be informed of innovative work. Be responsive to the needs. To connect to hundreds of outstanding charitable organizations serving our community, visit ckc.calgaryfoundation.org. To learn more about the Calgary Foundation, visit calgaryfoundation.org. Can I tell you a story? Sure. Okay, so um, when I, I mentioned that I was up in Yellowknife um, making a documentary with David Suzuki at one point in time, but I, on that same trip, I'd gone out to a place called Blatchford Lake Lodge, which is a, a lodge about 45 minute uh, ski plane flight uh, out of Yellowknife, you land on, on it, it's a beautiful place. It's on Dene Nation land. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it's very beautiful. And, and I, I went there to give two talks. They paid for my, my trip up there and they paid for my stay. And they, they it was the, the British cloud appreciation society. that <laughs> was, it was, it was there visiting and they wanted to hear some talks about the Aurora or whatever. And I went up and I gave them two one hour talks about the Aurora. That's what I gave and, and they were going to pay me a thousand dollars plus the costs of of being at the um, the lodge and the trip. And I decided I wanted to go to, to Great Slave Lake by snowmobile. It sounded really cool. And I said, and it's about, you know, it's it's quite a, quite a ways from Blatchford Lake. And and I said, look, why don't you not pay me the thousand bucks? And why don't you hire me a guide? And give me a snowmobile and that guy takes a snowmobile and we'll head out to great slave lake and and they said sure but you have to have two guides because that's the way it works because it's pretty remote and so the three of us headed off on our snowmobiles and we spent the day together and it was it was really it was it was worth a thousand bucks to me it was it was it was fabulous right and one of the one guide was from a place called um Deta, which is a indigenous t- town just outside of Yellowknife. And his name was Duncan, and he was about 40, and he was a Dene guide. And I, we talked a lot that day, and he told me that when he was younger, when he was three or four years old, his parents put him in the care of his grandfather. And that, not because his parents couldn't care for him, they, his parents wanted him to live closer to the land. And his grandfather, it was, and at least a, three years ago, two years ago, three years ago, he was still a trapper, a traditional trapper. And he lived about a hundred kilometers out in the bush. And every day he worked the trap lines. And so Duncan went up there with his grandfather. And from when he was three or four till when he was 11 or 12, he, he worked the trap lines with his grandfather every single day. And he said his grandfather wouldn't use a snowmobile because the fumes bothered the animals. And that would, you know, it made it harder to be a trapper and that he, and that his grandfather taught him about the land and taught him about the trees and taught him about the animals and taught him how to survive on the on the land and all of this. And I could just tell that this guy absolutely loved, loved the land, like loved it. And I was talking with him and I and, and I got the impression that he had kind of 
even conflated the love of his grandfather for the land. Like somehow this was all wrapped up in this beautiful childhood experience that he'd had. And then he went back and he, you know, he, he, he went back and he went back to school and graduated from high school, got some kind of a trade diploma and then went and worked at a mine for some number of years, saved enough money to buy a house in Data, buy all the stuff to become a, 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 a guide. And now he's a guide. And I, I'm saying all of this because this guy might well have been the happiest person I've ever met. Like, I don't mean euphoric, I mean happy, grounded comfortable and i had this impression i got this overwhelming impression from him that that everything for him was about the love of the land he wanted to share that love of the land and that he was making good decisions for himself and his family and his life because those decisions were coming from love and if you look at what we do as a society we're almost the opposite of that you know we're we're just paving stuff over and and building stuff and polluting stuff and and making all kinds of terrible decisions because we don't love the land as a society and so again all kinds of rational reasons why we would want to advance and progress the way that we do but there those rational reasons are i think in a lot of ways taking us in the wrong direction eric you're you're a bit of an idealist there's uh there's a sense that you truly believe that people would do a quote unquote right thing given the opportunity and the uh spiritual direction to help themselves and other people well, out I, I, so, so hold on a second so i don't i actually don't think that's idealism right i i think i think i think that people make decisions like so so you don't you don't need to tell people you don't need to legislate to people to not smoke around their children if you can convince people that it's not good for their children to smoke around them and, 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 and agencies have done a good job of that, then people now don't smoke around children because they love their children. I don't know if that's true. I, I've worked as a home insurance adjuster, and I, that is strictly not the case. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that, um, you know, as a, uh, as a scientist and as a person that uh, has an open enough mind to try to listen to, I mean, I, I mean, this in a different uh, semantic, but rational discourse, uh, uh, a language in which people uh, want a convergent discussion, whether that's possible or not. Um, th there is a, a bias that um, people are interested in um, if not a correct way of living, a coherent one, uh, a, com a community-driven one, a uh, coexisting one. And I think that's what I mean by the word idealism. I, I don't mean it in a necessarily, well, I mean, it is, I guess, inherently judgmental. But, you know, there's this thing I hear when you speak, and I think it will show in your work as an artist and a sci scientist, and this is not a negative thing, that there's a, a principle in humanity that um, there's something inherently wholesome about it, um, that our experiences lead us to want not just to better ourselves in a, in a rationalist, materialistic sense, but to um, lift everyone around us so that we're all kind of, um, I don't know, metaphorically holding hands maybe, or, or just uh, getting through it together. Um, so just this interesting sociological um, study, which I, I, I can't check for rest. I, don't, I mean, I read a little bit, but I, I'm not a researcher. Um, but I did know this uh, when I've read about communes, that there is a, uh, a number, a statistical number in which human beings can't coexist without legislation or rules. Um, that there's, I think in the commune, like the hippie communes is around 75, 100 people. And scientifically, it's around that point where those relationships break down. And so, for example, you and I, Eric, have no genealogical um, connections. Uh, we live in different parts of the city. Um, if my family and your family live together uh, on a farmland, we could probably become very good friends. But um, if we invited everybody from, let's say, again, oh, just because this is where we met, Exposure Studios, there's uh, 30, 25 people plus the instructors, and they brought all of their extended families, we would start to have trouble. Um, because we all will have, kind of like what you brought up with art, divergent interests. Uh, and ones that will inevitably somehow come in conflict with each other. Um, and so we live in this balancing act, I think. And I, I think that's what makes your work so interesting to me because... Uh, I, I'd like to interject because 
because like um what you're saying and i mean that i've heard that 75 number be, you know in in it may be where you heard it uh have you read sapiens there's this, there's this book and, and i actually didn't read it i i, I listened to the audio book because i was driving around bc oh. you know in, in may and that's listening. reading it yeah yeah and so apparently he talks about the concept of, of you said legislation and, and laws he talks about the concept of what he calls fictions and he feels that homo sapiens won out as the dominant um homo species because we developed the capacity to create and live within what he calls fictions right and so he, he would refer to canada as a fiction it's not real it's just a made-up thing it's just a piece of paper you know and an agreement among people to have this thing called canada but i mean you know a thousand years ago it didn't exist and 10,000 years from now it probably won't exist and it because it's not real but because we can create this thing and all buy into the fact that we're canadian then if i'm in europe and i'm in trouble and i see someone with a backpack with a canadian flag on it i figure i could probably go up and ask them for help because we probably have some things in common more in common than the other people around me here at least reliably so and if i'm a fellow employee of the university of calgary and i meet somebody and I, this happened to me on a ferry in the Gulf Islands a few years ago. And I meet somebody and start talking and he works at the University of Calgary and I work at the University of Calgary. So we have something in common. We're both profs. And then that's a good starting point for trusting somebody. If you're Catholic and I'm Catholic, we have something in common. If you're in the Canadian military and I'm in the Canadian military, we have something in common. And that allows people, those fictions allow us to cooperate on numbers much larger than that 75 that we can adopt a common cause. And my and my my feeling what I'm what I get at and I I mean and I and it's funny because I would you know I probably am an idealist right? you know almost certainly but what if the the thing that united us like so so that it, you you can't like if you're a tr if you're a troop of and if it was it was looking at primates on I think it was Zanzibar I think was where they did these studies where they found that if the numbers got up above 75 or so, they started murdering each other because they couldn't trust each other. You can't know more than that many people well enough that you can count on them because of what you know personally and directly from that experience. But let's say that everybody in Canada loved the land, every single person, and that becomes a unifying force. And, and I think for a lot of, um, and again, I, I, I could be wrong about, about this, but I do believe that for a lot of indigenous peoples, for a lot of First Nations, First Peoples, before we came along and messed everything up for them, um, that their unifying thing for a group would be much larger than 75 people was the land. And I've heard this from a number of indigenous people that, that our, our disrespect of the land is possibly going to be our downfall you know and so i think i think it's something, it's something that, you know if, if i had the resources to retire now it's something i'd spend about half my time on you know the other half being photography but it's interesting i have this the rhetorical question is going back to this idea at the beginning of globalization you know what if the problem isn't globalization but the aim of what globalization as in its current form is is trying to achieve so currently it's this yeah, yeah. rationalistic capitalistic thing of of money making but I think what you're positing is if globalization's aim was to uh, be at a measured peace with its environment, then then there would be great benefit. I, I'm both an idealist, uh, idealist and a cynic, so I, I don't think that's actually uh, you know possible. But um, I would say that I think more importantly for our discussion, at least for this podcast, is um, art as fiction making um, in the terms as you describe and. Uh, I used to use, I still often use the term, you know, generational, like when we talk about why human beings seem so different from other animal species and um, in the way we interact with the world. So the one defining thing is this discriminatory thing where I can um, make judgments of an object, whether it has value to me or to my family or, or et cetera. But um, what you brought up with the trapper, what you bring up with this idea of fiction, what we kind of loosely are talking about with so, uh, sociology um, this fiction building, this ability to create a narrative to unite uh, other human beings. This diver I'm, I'm uh, obsessed with this uh, uh, divergent and convergent uh, concept between uh, science and art. Um, and this as well, uh, I have 
uh, a discriminatory idea of uh, contemporary art that I need to get over, which is, I mean, maybe this is the ultimately the power of art, which is when it builds a narrative or a fiction that actually connects people, it has great intrinsic, intrinsic sociological value. Uh, outside of that, um, I mean, it's so ambiguous. <laughs> And I think leads to this warring nation mentality. You know, I, I, I'll pick a fight. I'll say something about, um, I mean, I don't often talk ill of Andy Warhol, but like, you know, a pop artist. And someone will, inevitably, someone will try to punch me in the face one day uh, because they'll have an emotional, intuitive thing because we're not building a narrative about, you know, what we see in it and what we could share and, and where it splits up. Um, you know, I... When I look and heard your talk at the um, event about uh, taking the data from the Aurora and finding ways to visualize the data as opposed to uh, having just great pictures. I mean, there are so many people that even make a living just taking pictures of the Aurora as, uh, as landscapes, essentially. But there's something interesting, I think, that, that runs through this whole conversation. This, uh, and again, whether it's something you intend or, or it's just a reflection of your personality, um, you're trying. I think you're trying to find a way to express this for laymen like me, to appreciate that the aurora is more than just uh, beautiful hues in the sky that I stay up to four in the morning to take a look at. That it's reflective of the earth, um, of something that you're very passionate about, the environment, our relationship to how we're dis well. Destroy is a, a very human context because uh, it's going to outlast us. So whatever effect we have, and, and when we're extinct, the earth is going to be like. Yeah, you guys fucked it up. Well, let's move on to the next animal. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's it's very it's very interesting because I I I have two relationships with the aurora, right? Like so so one is I I it's it's part of my physics work, and that's in fact my 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 relationship with the aurora is not emotional in that context. You know, I mean, I, I'm I'm emotional about the thing that I'm studying, which is the magnetosphere and the way things work and all of that. And the Aurora is really in the context of that part of my life. The Aurora is really just a scientific tool, right? That's it. Like it's, it's, I've got a computer, I've got a camera, I've got, um, you know, magnetometers that are spread around. I've got a camera that takes a picture of the Aurora. I've got the Aurora, itself but the, the aurora just fits into that matrix but then i've got my personal relationship with the aurora because i've i've been fortunate to see it a lot and you know and i and i find i've i have said on many occasions that if you if you if you if you are fortunate to see a really beautiful display of the aurora in a very beautiful setting that it, it for me, it, it, I, I remember the first time I saw a beautiful display of the Aurora and it changed something about the way I look at the world. Like, it, I, don't, I don't know how to describe it. It's like something about the night sky, something about seeing the world as, because it, it really is, it, it really is our cosmic shore, right? Like what you're looking at when you look at the Aurora is you're looking at the interface between space and the world we live in, right? Our our environment and the space environment, you know, extends out above the aurora. But really, this is a cosmic process which is happening a hundred kilometers above our head, and it's a truly cosmic process. And you can see it, you can feel that when you look when you look at it, you can kind of get that feeling. This is big. I mean, this is what I'm looking at is it, it, it's over the whole northern part of the earth and the whole southern part of the earth. And it's being driven by, by 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 the sun, by by the solar wind, by physics that I don't understand, that I understand some of, and and it's 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 beautiful. And I remember the first time I saw the aurora. It was it was I was sitting, but not not the first time I saw it, but the first time I saw a really beautiful display of the aurora. And I was sitting on a park bench uh, on a beach in Southampton, Ontario, and that that and Southampton, Lake Huron. The beach there, you're looking north over Lake Huron, and I was sitting with it was you know, and it's got it's got it's got a romantic association because I was sitting with with somebody you know who I very much liked, and um, and the aurora, like this this we, my friend and I saw the, this green light kind of 
come up over the horizon on the lake. And then it was really quiet and you could just hear the, you could hear the waves, like they were the small waves. And then the aurora just rose up and up and up and then it was up filling half the sky and it was totally quiet. And then it just sort of slowly receded and then disappeared over the northern horizon, maybe over the course of an hour. And I, I remember just being mesmerized by the whole thing, the whole feeling of that, that situation. And I, you know, I went to a conference in Alaska in 2010 or 11, I'm not sure, 11, I guess. And it was a conference on the Aurora. And I was one of the organizers and we organized a bus trip out of town and we were stopping on the way back and we, it was a fabulous Aurora display. And so we were on this ridge looking up and it was really, really beautiful, really fabulous. And I'm with all these people who are scientists in my field and they're talking about, oh, that's this. And they're talking about the science, right? And and I had I said, I'm gonna walk over here and just, I'm just gonna look at it. You know, cause, cause I, this is, when I'm looking at it that way, it's not, I'm not, it, it feels totally disconnected from the science for me. Was your first uh, a nice park bench experience before you became a scientist? It was, I was in, um, I was at, coming out of first year university, going into second year university. I had enrolled in, and I, I was, I, it was about a week before um, that school year started. So it'd be like late August, early September of, of 1981. And, and it was, I, I had chosen physics for my undergrad degree at that time. And I remember, I remember, I remember thinking that this was interesting, like that this, this was understanding things like this and exploring things like this was why I really wanted to go into physics. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, and I, and I think, and I think that certainly that night certainly had an impact on me eventually choosing to go into space physics. Yeah, I'm just imagining how you are, uh, you know, an artist who uh, took the long road to understand what he wanted to express. Um, and uh, not to reduce that to your experience, I wonder if that's where the best science comes from. You know, I get, we, curiosity, a sense of wonderment, what you describe is very visceral. It's very lived in. It, it is not rational. It is not dry. I, the thing that killed me in, in physics first year was math. I, mean, I thought I was good at math. And then I remember I took... Uh, whatever course, the, the textbook was like 170 pages and it felt like a single equation of two sides all the way to the end of the book. I mean, obviously it wasn't, but that was my immediate um, intuition. I dropped that course in like a week and then I was, and then I didn't go back to university for several years because I, I, I fucked around a lot. But um, it is it is interesting because uh, I have a, an uncle who is a mathematician and he kept telling me that I should be in a pure science because of, I guess, what he thought my brain was doing um, as I was a bit of a misfit uh, everywhere. Um, but speaking to you, I think perhaps this was what he was getting at, which is that if I could look at a scientific endeavor as a way to connect an experiential passion um, to something that would be a fiction, let's say, um, that I could communicate to other people. You know, maybe I could have uh, found something to be passionate and love about it as you have. Uh, I'm just happy to hear that you are um, coming back to us, to us uh, foolish, uh, you know, artists who uh, don't understand math uh, so that you can find a way to tell us what we might be missing uh, when we look at a picture of green and, and magentas. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's funny because I went to the Esker with my, I mean, I, I, every time I've gone to the Esker, I've gone with my son, but I went to the Esker with, with my son and um, there was this installation and it was called the wall and you walk in and it was in one of the side rooms and you walk in to this room and there were four projectors and it was this dizzying thing. And it was about the border wall between the, it was before Trump, it was about the border wall between well, I guess it's, I guess it's not before Trump, but it's it's it's. I don't think it was because of Trump's wall. It was actually about the pre-existing border wall. And it was a dizzying. Like you walk in there, and I've got this. I've got this. Um, 
really funny picture of my son where, where he's, he's like, I'm going to barf. Like he's, you know, so you walk into this room and they had projected one movie sequence on one wall, another movie sequence on another wall, on all four walls. And, 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 and it was like, you walk in there and it's like, it was, it was spinning. I mean, cause, cause you know, the, the walls going back by really fast and it's a different wall going by really fast. And it was quite dramatic and, and, you know, jarring, but I got, I was in there and I was looking at, walked up to the, to the, where the walls, where, where the, this, where this one wall came together with this other wall. And they had projected this in a way that they completely filled the wall but not over, like not one centimeter, nowhere along there. And then the other film was, you know, and, and it, this was quite honestly, what they had done was difficult, challenging from an optical design perspective. And, and I was, I have to say, I was really impressed and I've been actually really impressed by, you know, it, it is, it is funny. Like my son, my son thinks he's bad at math, right? Unless he's adding up dollars or points in a video game. Right. And then he, it's, it's like instant, right? And, and probably if you, if you say you're bad at math, then you're probably bad at math, but that's probably because of the way you learned math, as opposed to something innate about you, because, because I certainly, you know, I certainly struggled with math until I got to grade 13 in Ontario. And then I, I had for the first time, three fabulous math teachers in grade 13 and took a lot of math in grade 13. But then I remember you pan forward. I mean, you know, I've, I've taken math up to the like 600 level at U of A in one course that was you know, scary. And, um, but I mean, I remember this math 400 course at Western and we had this professor, doctor, doesn't matter. Anyway, I forget him. I forget his name. But anyway, we had this professor and he would start a, like something and he, and he, and he'd do a derivation and he'd be working for 45 or 50 minutes on this one derivation, like fill a board, erase it, fill a board, erase it. And we're still working on the same problem, right? And then he would get to the end of the class and he would say, dot, 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 like meaning he's picking it up next class, right? And, and you know, and, and so eventually all of us, like I, I remember in that course, I remember sitting around with my friends one night and we were, we were, we were studying and I, I just said, like, do you guys remember understanding what was going on, like in school? <laughs> and they're like, "Yeah, that seems like a thing of the past." Like we were just in over our heads, all of us. But um, yeah, it, it's math. Math's funny, and and it's it's math's an interesting thing. Thank you, Eric. I really appreciate you spending so much time with me. Um, no, well, it's good. It's good. It's good to get to know you a little bit. And I, I mean, I'm I'm sure we would have a lot, a lot in common, and and photographically too. Um, yeah. Well, whenever, I mean, uh, we'll see if the pandemic ever goes away, if it just keeps snowballing into the next one. But uh, yeah, one of the things I always talk about with uh, my guests and friends in the artistic community, it's going to be great when we can all actually uh, sit down somewhere, build new yeah. projects and just kind of do that collaborative thing again. I mean, this has been a great, uh, technology has helped so much that we aren't just sitting in caves uh, by ourselves, but um We'll see what all, what all this evolves into. It'll be uh, it'll be fascinating when when the dams break, uh, the outpouring of energy. Yeah. You know, it, 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 I don't know how it's been for you, but I've 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 had I've had a remarkably social year. You know, um, with the caveat being, I have had very little direct contact with yep. people. Me too. Yeah, I like the joke that COVID's been great for me. It hasn't, but uh, it has because. Uh, you know, I don't know if we would have been able to have this two-hour conversation um, just hanging out. It would be different. It would definitely be different. Uh, and um, there's always something to complain about or find a reason not to do something. And I find I've been doing, I'm trying to do the opposite. Finding a reason to do something uh, instead of isolating has been a powerful lesson in COVID. You know, I, I, heard, I heard on CBC, like... On, on New Year's Eve, they they often do this retrospective about the year. And one of the things they did on CBC Radio was uh, interview uh, asking people, stopping people on the street in Toronto and saying, okay, okay, what's the silver lining for 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 the pandemic? And this one guy, it was really funny because this guy said, this guy said, well, I mean, you know, honestly, not traveling this year. Like I, I've, I, you know, I, I've, I've been working from home, not traveling. 
you know, it's, which was changed my relationship with my family and it's allowed me to focus more and more intensely. I can see, you know, the, the, the benefits of that. And then the, the interviewer said, so what are you looking forward to post pandemic? And he goes, Oh, traveling. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I have to say that, that not traveling has been an interesting thing for me, but I'm also looking forward to traveling. And the pandemic did one thing for me, which I'm very grateful for, which is I went to Vancouver Island for two months for May and June because I was, when the term ended last year, I was sitting at my dining room table, realizing, thinking, all I do all day is type at my dining room table. That's all I do for work. And the place that I stay at on Vancouver Island has a dining room table. I remember having this thing, and 24 hours later, I was checking into the place that I stay at on Vancouver Island, and I stayed there for two months. The guy gave it to me for 600 bucks a week. It's a beautiful place on the water. I had... I had, I worked a lot of work, but I went out every day, you know, on the ocean and went to Tofino and Victoria and wouldn't have had a chance to do that. It's the longest I've spent on Vancouver Island since 1973. What's your favorite weather and why? That's a hard, that's a very hard one, right? Because there's, there's very little weather that I don't like. Like when it gets down to minus, you know, when it gets down to minus 40, it's, it, you know, it, it's not. It's not pleasant, but I, you know, when I, you know, and, it, and, and of course it's not getting down to minus 40 anymore because, you know, everything is definitely warmer than it has been. But like, I, you know, I remember in, in my first trip up to Yellowknife, which was back in 2010 or 2000, no, 2007, actually, it was minus 50 degrees. It was minus 50, right? And, and I was, and I went for a walk outside and I remember just, you know, the, 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 the way the sound, the, the snow sounded when you were walking, like the crunch of that, the, the, the look and the feel of like the look of the way the smokes were coming out of smokestacks and, and, and chimneys. And, you know, just the, there was something extreme and very beautiful about it to me, you know, and, and again, with the caveat that that's not pleasant, you know, you know, when I, when I, when I first moved to Edmonton from Ontario, I remember it was, it was, it was a prolonged period that year in 1989, where in February of 89, it was below minus 35 for more than a whole week and dipping below minus 40 for the only time in more than a century in Edmonton. And I remember talking to friends of mine back in Ontario and they were saying, yeah, but it's a dry cold. And I'm like, no, it's, it's, it's just really cold, you know, so that you know, that, that kind of weather is, is not pleasant, but I can find, you know, if I think about all other kinds of weather, you know, they're, they're because weather for me, weather, like I, I, I associate weather with memories. So if, if it's, if it's, you know, I, I, like, I remember, you know, in Ontario, we had the lakes that the, the really nice, really beautiful thing in Ontario are the lakes in Southern Ontario that are warm and you can swim in, swim in them totally comfortably in the summer. You know, it's not like here, here you, you kind of got to be brave to swim, generally speaking, in, in Alberta, right? But, uh, but back in Ontario, it was just completely comfortable. And I remember swimming with friends of mine uh, in, in a place called uh, Cameron Lake, about a halfway, about a third of the way between Toronto and Ottawa. And it was really warm. It was, you know, like 25, 30 degrees Celsius. And it was one in the morning and it was pouring rain, you know, and that it just, it was an immersive beautiful, fabulous experience weather-wise. And then I can think about, um, you know, fall when, when, it, when it's crisp and, you know, 10 degrees Celsius in the fall and, and you've got the colors in, in the forest and the way that feels. And that's a, kind of an immersive thing to me. And and then, you, you know, like, like some, sometimes when I'm on the West Coast, if I'm on the West Coast in the winter, at nighttime, when it's all that that misty fogginess and that that muffles all the sound, and it's dark, right? It's really, really dark because there's no snow, right? So you just got the green, the evergreen trees and the, and the, and the fog, and it's really quiet. And, and again, I, and I think the word immersive comes to mind for me, like, like weather, weather is something we're in and it's an immersive experience. And so I, 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 I couldn't give you a favorite kind of weather. I can tell you that the only weather I don't find pleasant is when it gets really, really cold. And that temperature is rising as I get older, like the limit of that, <laughs> like, like um, that I definitely notice. The tolerance level. I, I, I would sum up your answers. You just like weather. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know. I, and I really do. I mean, I really I like, like weather is weather, you know, I, it's funny when I was an undergraduate, I would get really busy, you know, because, because, you know, my undergraduate program was quite brutal at the, at the university of Western Ontario. And I would oftentimes find myself get, getting disconnected from the world. Like I was just working all the time and I'd be walking, thinking about my work and, and, and all of this. And then I remember one time walking along and I looked up and I was like, it's really beautiful out, <laughs> you know? So, so yeah, I mean, I love weather. And I, I maybe I, I can add one thing, which is I, I seldom, if ever check the weather. Uh, you mean starting the day? Yeah. I mean, like, so if, if I'm, if I'm going out to Banff, I mean, I, I make sure I have, you know, a sweater, a Gore-Tex coat, a t-shirt, shorts, like I make sure I have a range of clothing, but I don't care what the weather's going to be. Like I, I, well, I figure I'm going to love it. It's a lot of freedom in that. Yeah. I check. Yeah. I definitely check. I'm preoccupied. Almost everybody does. Yeah. Yeah. Almost everybody does. And it's funny because my ex-wife, like we used to kayak together a lot and we'd get up in the morning and she'd be like, well, it's, it's raining, you know? And, and I'd be like, but we're going to Golden in British Columbia. And there's no relationship between the weather here and the weather in Golden. And all the people I kayak with were like that. They were like, but it's rainy and cold. And I'm going, it's probably going to be 30 degrees and sunny in Golden. Like, what are you worried about? So, so, okay. All right. Well, um, David, thank you. Here's another message from one of our two sponsors today. The show you're listening to is part of the Alberta Podcast Network. Locally grown, community supported. Another show from the network that you should check out is Repodcasting. Have you ever watched a movie and there was an actor in it that was all wrong for the part they were playing? Have you ever wanted to imagine someone else in the role? Never fear. That's precisely why Repodcasting exists. Listen as co-hosts and cousins Janet and Lucia recast their favorite and not-so-favorite movies with their dream cast. They also take a moment each episode to imagine which role in the film should have been given to Tony Danza, because, let's face it, Tony Danza would make every movie better. You can find Repodcasting wherever you listen to podcasts or at albertapodcastnetwork.com. Happy listening! Thank you, Eric, for your time. Now, let's all take a moment to review. Social coexistence is crucial to the survival of humanity, but it's also fascinatingly abstract. At its worst, we're capable of brutal violence, and at its best, we can connect with empathy and love. Somewhere in this complex relationship lies creative inspiration, or at least it seems that way. We can't always just look outside for a cue to build something new. The way we approach the outside world is as much a reflection of our state within. I think this bears some intentional reflection. How do you relate to your peers, to the world around you, to nature? How aware of you of the fictions that frame the very reality you exist in? If we spend some time here, I think new narratives will emerge to explore with our art. So let's do that then. Let's take a quiet moment and reflect on the definitions and relationships all around us. There's a personal project there waiting to act on.